Okay, good. Welcome to Ashbrook's Constitution Day lecture this year. Uh, before we introduce our speaker, let me just mention a couple of other upcoming events. We have uh, two colloquia to mention. One's on Friday, October 28th with David Tucker. Some of you may know David Tucker. He works for the Ashbrook Center. And he'll be talking on what is the best way to deal with ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and similar organizations. Should be interesting. Fun topic. Um, Friday, November 18th, James Caesar will be here talking about the 2016 election. So notice this is after the election will have taken place. So that should be, that should be fun. Uh, the title of his talk is actually 2016, the election, the best outcome to the worst choice, with a question mark. <laughs> so that'll be interesting. We have a couple of uh, major issues uh, lectures uh, coming up, major issues lectures. Wednesday, September 21st, Jim Buchwald and Alex Wright will be talking about uh, Made in America, creation of one of the best capital goods companies in the world. Uh, should be fun as well. And then Thursday, October 20th, an evening with Cal Thomas. This is a long title. How we got here and where we are going if things don't change, what works, common sense solutions for a stronger America. Okay, so it could, it could be on anything, <laughs> given that title. But we're very happy to have with us uh, this afternoon Stephen Knott, Professor Stephen Knott, who will be talking about the Founders Presidency versus the Progressive Presidency. <laughs> professor Knott is a Professor of National Security Affairs at the United States Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Prior to accepting his position at the War College, uh, Professor Knott co-chaired the Presidential Oral History Program at the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia. He's written several books. All of them are worth reading. Uh, his books include The Reagan Years, Alexander Hamilton and the Persistence of Myth, Secret and Sanctioned Covert Operations and the American Presidency, At Reagan's Side, Insider's Recollections from Sacramento to the White House, Rush to Judgment, George W. Bush, The War on Terror and His Critics, and most recently, Washington and Hamilton, The Alliance That Forged America. It's an outstanding book. It's got a lot of good, a lot of good press and a lot of good reviews. Uh, professor Knott also serves as the Thomas and Mabel Guy Professor of American History and Government in the Ashbrook Center's Master of Arts in American History and Government program. Uh, Steve's been teaching almost from the beginning of this program. He's a regular, he's an exceptional teacher. The students praise him repeatedly uh, for his ability to, to not only teach well, but to just be a, an approachable, good guy in, in every sense. Um, so we're grateful that you could be here. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Stephen Knott. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you all very much. I'm delighted to see such a large crowd on such a, a beautiful day. It really is an honor to be here. I know you hear folks say that quite a bit when they begin a speech but, um, or a talk. Uh, but I really mean that. I've been coming here. My first appearance here was in 2005. Uh, when the late Peter Schramm invited me to come and give a talk on Alexander Hamilton. And then the following year, he invited me back. I guess I passed the test on that first talk. Uh, he invited me back to teach in the, the MAG program that summer, and I've been teaching in that program now for, for 10 years. So there are so many familiar faces in this crowd, and I was saying to my wife the other day that I really look forward every summer uh, to coming back here to Ashland and to the Ashbrook Center. It's such a, a terrific place. And all of you who are Ashbrook scholars should be, and I know you are, thrilled to be part of this program because it really is one of the best in the country. Uh, there's no doubt about that in my mind. Uh, it's unfortunately somewhat rare these days for um, academic institutions to focus on the American founding or to even focus on American political history. And you folks are sort of in the vanguard of this small but very important effort to try to keep that tradition, keep those traditions alive. So uh, in all honesty, God, God bless you all, for your teachers and the students as well, for being part of this terrific program. I want to talk to you today about the American presidency. Um, although I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, haven't we heard enough about the presidency in the last few months? Uh, I think in 2012 there were over one million television ads uh, broadcast during the uh, Romney-Obama race, and it's projected that this year will exceed that number. Seems hard to believe. And of course, you're all at ground zero here 
in Ohio, so you're really going to get bombarded. But bear with me. Uh, let me begin by noting that I've spent my entire adult life studying the Founding Fathers and the American Constitution, but with a particular focus on the American presidency. And I do have a bias of sorts that I'll put right up front, and that is that I tend to, when I look at the founding era, I tend to sort of favor the Federalists, the people we call Federalists, uh, most particularly George Washington and Alexander Hamilton. Uh, it, is, it is my belief that this alliance, this partnership between Washington and Hamilton was the most critical relationship of the founding period, although I know that fans of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison would, would disagree. Uh, but those first eight years of the American experience during the presidency of George Washington with Hamilton at Washington's side, this was the period in which the United States was sort of launched on the path toward becoming an economic and military superpower with the presidency leading the way. So let me talk just a little bit about Hamilton's conception of presidential power, which was put into practice by President Washington with Hamilton at his side as the nation's first Treasury Secretary. Uh, if you look at Hamilton's writings in the Federalist Papers dealing with the presidency, he talks at some length about the importance of the president being one person, or a unitary executive, as some folks have called it. And this was important because there were delegates at the Constitutional Convention who argued that we should have a plural executive. We should have a committee of three. And Hamilton's counterargument, along with others, James Wilson and a few other folks, was that that, was, that would be a mistake. It would dilute responsibility. And responsibility was particularly important in terms of the execution of war. So the notion of the president as commander in chief and responsible for the conduct of war, um, I think we owe quite a bit to, to the exertions of Hamilton and James Wilson and others. Hamilton goes on in the Federalist Papers to argue for what he calls competent powers for the nation's chief executive. By that, he means the qualified veto power that the president possesses, uh, the take care clause. It's the president's responsibility to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Uh, the pardon power, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also, Hamilton emphasizes in the Federalist Papers the importance of the president being able to move with, quote, decision, activity, secrecy, and dispatch. And you see this, uh, you see this idea being incorporated very quickly into the new government. One of the first proposals that President Washington puts forward in his first annual message to Congress is that Congress give the president a secret service fund. This is one aspect of the founding era which unfortunately I think gets overlooked quite a bit. Uh, and that secret service fund was going to be at the president's disposal. And he was not required to report to Congress how he spent that money. It's a remarkable exception that Congress gives to the president over their control of the power of the purse. We can talk about that some more later, if you wish, during the question and answer uh, period. So these qualities of decision, activity, secrecy, and dispatch were the essential ingredients of what Hamilton called an energetic executive. The president was also, in Hamilton and Washington's view, and in the view of most of the founders, was to act as the head of state, not as a party leader, not as a partisan, but as the head of state, and he was supposed to temper the excesses of the branch closest to the people, which was the House of Representatives. Uh, one of the ways that you would sort of make sure that you had a president who would uh, check the excesses, potential excesses of the masses, to use a modern term, uh, was to select him in such a way that he would be somewhat insulated from public opinion and public pressure. And that, of course, is where the Electoral College came into being. Unfortunately, the Electoral College these days is pretty much just a, a rubber stamp for popular opinion. But in Hamilton's view and the view of some of the founders, the Electoral College was going to be sure that fit characters, as Hamilton put it, fit 
characters would be selected for this most important office. And Hamilton actually states in the Federalist Papers that he saw, quote, a constant probability of seeing the station, the presidency, filled by characters preeminent for ability and virtue. Constant probability of seeing the office filled by characters preeminent for ability and virtue. And it was the job of the Electoral College to ensure that would happen. Now, it's true, of course, that the original intention of the Electoral College was quickly rendered moot by the rise of political parties. Uh, and those parties, it should be noted, however, instituted mechanisms that were designed to filter or to some extent replicate the Electoral College. By the way, if you're interested in this notion of political parties, at least the early version, sort of replicating the Electoral College, there's an essay by James Caesar at the University of Virginia that's absolutely terrific on this count and talks about Martin Van Buren. Uh, where is it? Where is, there he is up there with the, the big mutton chop uh, <laughs> sideburns. Martin Van Buren, uh, as sort of the founding father of the political party system, which acted as a sort of filter in terms of selecting or perhaps preventing those who were overly ambitious and lacked a kind of uh, moderation or lacked the temperament to be president. Van Buren's system was designed to sort of weed those folks out of the process. Uh, unfortunately, and we can get into this later, the political parties no longer filter uh, uh, these individuals who seek to be president. And instead, the goal seems to be, at least since uh, the early 20th century, as a candidate, it's your job to capture the party, and then you impose your will on the party. And that's been, a, a, I think, an ongoing process of which we've seen uh, very much in, in place today. You saw it particularly in the Democratic Party throughout the 20th century. John F. Kennedy was not the choice of party leaders. He sort of seized the party mechanism by winning in a series of primaries. Uh, George McGovern, Jimmy Carter, uh, Barack Obama to some extent in 08, and certainly Donald Trump in 016 have, have done the same. <laughs> so the early founding system is quickly displaced by a party selection system, which is displaced in the 20th century by this uh, idea of insurgent candidates capturing the party mechanism and then imposing their will on the party. And the theoretical justification for this kind of uh, uh, selection process is provided by Woodrow Wilson. So it's really Woodrow Wilson and to some extent Teddy Roosevelt that changed the whole process for or of presidential selection. I should also note, by the way, that I'm sure this is familiar to all of you, but not only did Wilson and TR seek to change the way we select our presidents, they also sought to radically change the the powers of the office, to expand the powers of the office, I think well beyond what the Founding Fathers intended. And some of you may be familiar with Teddy Roosevelt's conception of presidential power, which has been called the stewardship theory, uh, that the president is the steward of the national interest. Uh, and I'll just read you a quote. I, w I don't want to bury you in quotes here, but this is a pretty good one from, from TR, who uh, talking about Congress and implied powers and his obligations as president, quote, I acted for the public welfare. I acted for the well-being of all of our people whenever and in whatever manner was necessary unless prevented by direct constitutional or legislative prohibition. In other words, where the Constitution is silent or where the legislature is silent, it's the president's job to fill that vacuum. In other words, you're going to push those boundaries. You're going to even go beyond those boundaries, if need be, in the name of, uh, of, of the common good. Um, T.R. loved Alexander Hamilton, but I think he completely misinterpreted what Hamilton was about. Yes, Hamilton was in favor of an energetic executive, but within the confines of the Constitution. So. Uh, Hamilton would never have endorsed, I believe, the idea that if the Constitution is silent about something, you just sort of drive a truck right through that gap 
and fill it any way you see fit. A um, couple of other things for TR. Um, Washington and Jackson and Abraham Lincoln, of course, had this notion of uh, uh, the idea that in times of emergency, the presidents could, could engage in what's been called emergency or prerogative power. But TR kind of mainstreams that. He takes this, you know, he takes the Lincoln example from the Civil War and says, we can do this almost on a day-to-day -day basis. In other words, it's not just for extraordinary times that the president should exercise these remarkable powers. It's for sort of day-to-day -day administering of the United States government, whether it's the foreign policy sphere or the domestic policy sphere. So you have to keep in mind that there was a sort of radical change in the conception of presidential power that begins with Teddy Roosevelt. He succeeded by Taft, but then Woodrow Wilson. And Wilson, being an academic uh, from Princeton, by the way, our lone PhD president, which may be a warning for the future. Don't be careful of PhDs. Uh, in elective office, not in the classroom. You owe them your great respect in the classroom. Um, uh, uh, Wilson provides the sort of uh, intellectual or philosophical uh, framework, uh, where T.R. is kind of a man of action, Woodrow Wilson's more cerebral, Wilson kind of admires what T.R. does and sort of puts it all in a sort of packaged and manageable faction, a fashion which uh, alters the presidency forever. So the Hamiltonian concept of the presidency is completely displaced by this T.R. Wilson conception, which is essentially the following. The United States Constitution was not fit for the complicated or complex life of the 20th century. The Constitution had to grow. It, it was an organic document. It had to evolve, and it had to evolve to fit the complexities of the 20th century. We couldn't be governed, shouldn't be governed anymore by a document that was written in horse and buggy days. We were now in an industrial, scientific, technological age, and we had to adjust. According to Wilson and TR, the separation of power was an obstacle to this evolution. It was an obstacle to progress. And it was the responsibility of the president to break the gridlock caused by the separation of powers. That was his job. And part of the way he was going to do that was appeal directly to you and to me to go over the heads of Congress and to make his case, lay out his vision. That was an important word for Woodrow Wilson, the president's vision. It was his responsibility to implement that. The president could break this gridlock in Congress and this gridlock created by the separation of powers in part by becoming the leader of his party. So in other words, the party mechanism allows him to circumvent the separation of powers. The founders assumed that Congress, acting in their self-interest, would act as a check on the presidency. Wilson sees that link between the party in the White House and the party in Congress as a way to get around that roadblock of separation of powers. Okay? So you begin to see a kind of disciplining. You begin to see this assumption that the guy who lives in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is really the leader of the party, his party, in Congress. All right, so that's one way you get around the gridlock caused by separation of powers. Wilson also argues, of course, that um, presidential primaries, primaries are, way, are the way to go in terms of selecting a president. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, it's the job of the nominee of the party to impose his will on the party, not the other way around. Wilson, of course, also believed that the nation needed to be governed by an administrative state run by experts and specialists. So because of scientific advantages, advances, excuse me, because of technological advances, we were now in a position to, uh, uh, to create a, a government of experts who would, to some extent, carry out the people's will by applying the new tools of science and technology. Uh, and as I also mentioned, again, it's the president's job to be a visionary, to be a kind of educator-in-chief, right? To educate all of us 
uh, the, the best way to, for the United States to keep progressing ahead. And the final point I'll make about this Wilsonian conception of presidential power as opposed to the founders, particularly Hamilton's conception, is that Wilson believed the power of the presidency derived from the personal qualities of the president. The president was free to be as big a man as he wanted to be. So power is no longer rooted in Article II of the Constitution, but rooted in sort of personal qualities, personal popularity. Um, the word that was frequently bandied about at this time was, was and it was a new kind of social science-y word, charisma. The charismatic qualities of the president were critical to presidential success, not the Constitution. Unfortunately, in my view, we continue to live under Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson's regime more than a century later. As I said, Wilson upended the Hamiltonian or constitutional understanding of the role of the president and upended, and this is critical, Wilson and TR upended the sense of what a president can be expected to achieve. Unfortunately, the Wilsonian conception of the presidency, which has been adopted wholeheartedly by Democrats and eventually by Republicans, has produced a massive expectations gap, what I call a long train of heightened expectations followed by dashed hopes. And let me just give you some examples of what I'm talking about here. John F. Kennedy, uh, arguably the epitome of sort of Wilson's personalized presidency of charis charismatic qualities, who was not the choice of party leaders. In fact, the Kennedy campaign in 1960 was a family effort, the Kennedy machine you've probably heard referred to. Kennedy uh, embraced Wilson's notion that, and it's got a progressive notion, that due to advances in science and technology, man can be as big as he wants. That's a quote from President Kennedy. Quote, man can be as big as he wants. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. Kennedy would go on to add in his inaugural address in this sort of optimistic, uh, we can do anything if we put our minds to it notion, quote, the United States would bear any burden, pay any price, and that, of course, arguably led us into the swamps of Vietnam. I should note, by the way, that Kennedy's conception and Wilson's conception of presidential power was wholeheartedly embraced by the nation's leading historians and political science scientists of the day. I'm talking about people like Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., Richard Neustadt, who wrote a book called Presidential Power, which is still frequently used in college courses. Neustadt was sort of an unofficial advisor to JFK. All of these men believed in this notion of kind of a somewhat all-powerful presidency capable of uh, overriding separation of powers and checks and balances. By the way, JFK remains one of our most admired presidents, if you believe public opinion polls. And I would argue his legacy as a president continues to distort our understanding of the presidency. His successor, Lyndon Baines Johnson, in also inflated expectations as to the capabilities of both the presidency and the federal government writ large. Johnson was going to build a great society. Uh, and even at one point during the Vietnam War, he said that the way to win that war in Vietnam was to build something similar to the Tennessee Valley Authority in the Mekong Delta of South Vietnam. That if we could just provide electric power to the Vietnamese, we'd win. Uh, uh, members of his administration also claimed that they would abolish poverty in the United States by 1975. It was within our power, it was in the power of the federal government to completely eradicate poverty. Thus, thus one of our many wars of the 20th century, the war on poverty. I should also add that for Johnson, there didn't seem to be any boundary between himself and the office that he held. At one point, this, this is a legit, apparently it's not apocryphal, he was, had just finished a speech somewhere, 
They had a bunch of presidential helicopters on the lawn. He started heading towards the wrong helicopter. One of his Marine guards said to him, Mr. President, that's your helicopter over there. And Johnson froze him, you know, gave him a stare and just said, son, they're all my helicopters. Uh, Richard Nixon, of course, I think also saw few constitutional limits to his power, uh, uttering perhaps one of the most famous quotes in the history of the presidency, or infamous, quote, if the president does it, it is not illegal. If the president does it, it is not illegal. That was a quote that he gave to David Frost in those famous interviews. <laughs> Nixon continues this process of attempting to sort of constantly rally the American public by uh, using war metaphors. So it's under Richard Nixon that we have both the beginnings of the war on drugs and the war on cancer. Jimmy Carter, in some ways a reaction, of course, to Richard Nixon, but even here, Carter was not the choice of the party leadership. And I believe Carter also inflated the expectations of what he could deliver to the American people. In fact, Carter's vice president, Walter Mondale, who would later go on to challenge Ronald Reagan for the presidency, was quoted once as, say, as saying that it was the role of the United States government to, quote, assist the sad. Assist the sad. I'm not quite sure what he meant by that. If it was like putting uh, some antidepressants in all the water supplies in the nation. Of, <laughs> whatever. Uh, the Carter would add in 1976 that he wanted a government that was good, as good, and honest, and decent, and compassionate, and competent, and as filled with love as our, I always have trouble reading this, and as filled with love as are the American people. I don't know about you, but I don't want a government filled with love, but that's, maybe that's just me. Uh, to make sure here that I'm not just picking on Democrats, um, certainly George W. Bush offered inflated expectations of what he could deliver as a president. I've actually defended Bush, a number, number of Bush's policies, but it is true that his idea that we could democratize the Middle East uh, was probably fits in the category of an inflated expectation. And he would conduct a war on terror instead of a war on a particular nation or a particular terrorist group. Barack Obama, of course, not the choice of party leaders in 2008. Also, I think, inflating expectation. When he clinched the Democratic Party's nomination in 2008, he said, quote, this was the moment when the rise of the oceans begin to slow and our planet begins to heal. Uh, to me, that strikes me as inflated rhetoric, uh, that his election was going to slow the rise of the oceans. And now this brings us to 2016. I hope we don't spend too much time on this, but, um, well, we certainly can. But the expectations gap, I think, is still being driven by people like Donald Trump, uh, who is suggesting that he will build a wall that the Mexicans will pay for, however that's going to be done. But this constant inflated rhetoric, some would call it demagoguery, some would call it pandering, I believe would repulse the Founding Fathers. And in fact, I can assure you that Alexander Hamilton, I can't assure you, but that Alexander <laughs> Hamilton is rolling over in his grave. The more we have democratized the office of the presidency, unfortunately, the less respect it receives. The constitutional or Hamiltonian presidency at least provided both a floor and a ceiling that protected the office, that provided certain limits, but also energized the office of the presidency. And without, these, without this floor and ceiling, the office of the presidency is vulnerable. Unfortunately, we live in a time, as political scientist Hugh Hecklow has called it, of hyper-democracy. Our 24-7 media coverage, our 24-7 being plugged in 24-7, uh, talk radio, uh, cable news running around the clock with its focus on scandals, on conspiracy, 
the cost of all this is that any sense of deliberation, which the founders hoped would be built into the system, has been lost in this constant media din. And the new god, in a sense, of the American political system is the god of public opinion. And candidates seem committed to continuing to pander to public opinion. What I would hope to see is a rebirth of Hamilton's constitutional conception of the presidency, which would roll back some of the more egregious elements of this personalized presidency. And the thing is, and I'm a believer in an energetic executive, Hamilton's constitutional presidency would still possess, possess formidable weapons, the veto, the commander-in-chief power, the pardon power, the treaty power that the president shares with the Senate, and other powers listed in Article II. And perhaps most importantly, the Hamiltonian or constitutional presidency would, would allow for the restoration of the president, perhaps, as the head of state, the role that he plays or she plays as head of state. Um, that, that has been supplanted by the role the president plays as a party leader. It's difficult to be a partisan one day and a statesman speaking for all of the American people the next. It's a near impossible task. By restoring Hamilton's constitutional presidency, one other positive aspect might well be that we can force Congress to begin to conduct itself in a manner intended by the founding fathers. And that's a, a side effect that maybe we can get into in the question and answer period. I grant you the prospects are this, for this, for this restoration of a Hamiltonian presidency are very remote, but I'm not prepared to give up just yet. Thank you. I'll take your questions now. <laughs> Hopefully I inspired. Yes, sir. Thank you for coming. Sure. Um, what would you say to Chris of Hamilton who would suggest that the Hamilton of the Federalist Papers era is not the same as the Hamilton of the Report on Public Credit and the establishment of So where is the political thought consistent? Yeah, I, I think there is a remarkable consistency in Hamilton's political thought, and it, it, it predates the Federalist Papers. He wrote a letter in, I think, September 1780 to a guy by the name of James Duane, D-U-A-N-E, in which he basically outlines his conception. <laughs> and this, by the way, is a staff officer in Georgia. We haven't even won the revolution yet. And he writes this massive letter outlining the changes that he needs, he believes needs to take place to supplant what he views as a very effect, ineffective <coughs> Articles of Confederation. So I think there is a consistency there. Um, are you getting at something specific? Do you see, go ahead, do you want to? I guess mainly just how could it be said that the Federalist Papers are sort of a philosophical document meant to, you know, just as a means to an end rather than what he actually thought that the Federalist Papers should be? Or, or is it that that's what he actually thought? Um, I, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to argue that he genuinely believed this, that these were not just op-eds written to secure uh, the ratification of the Constitution. Um, Hamilton, of course, had argued at the Constitutional Convention for a president elected for life, which means we'd still be in year 30-something of the Jimmy Carter presidency, which is kind of a terrifying prospect for me, but that's neither here nor there. Um, he felt that uh, what had emerged from the Constitutional Convention with the president holding office for four years and being re-eligible, no term limits until the 1950s, uh, that was good enough for him. So everything Hamilton tried to do throughout his public career was designed to <coughs> infuse as much energy and stability and permanence into this new national government as he possibly could. And he was particularly concerned about making sure that this new national government could conduct a war in a fashion that might allow us to win. As opposed, I mean, he, it's a miracle we won the American Revolution. And he'd probably be the first one to tell you that. It was just constant shortages of men and materiel, supplies, etc. We won, but both Hamilton and Washington were determined to and this is why they kind of both push for a constitutional convention to infuse 
energy into this government, particularly in regards to national defense. So I see, I, again, I see a golden thread throughout all of Hamilton's writings on this from the day he, up till the day he dies. Yes, sir. Thank you for coming. Sure. Um, I just wanted to ask, do you think it's realistic to expect that we could see someone rise to the point of being a presidential candidate who carries themselves in the way of a Hamiltonian presidency, founder era presidency? Do you think that when public opinion governs so much that that person right. would ever be able to even ascend to the point of being able to be elected? And if so, who? Is there anything <laughs> I would say in mo modern times, and by modern, you guys are going to laugh at this, but for me this is modern. Uh, Eisenhower, <laughs> in the go ahead and laugh. Eisenhower in the 1950s, um, you know, I wouldn't, I mean, to some extent, yes, he was a creature of public opinion because the American people loved him for Operation Overlord and for presiding over a successful war. Um, but I wouldn't say that Eisenhower was a creature of public opinion polls. I wouldn't say that he even paid any attention to them. Uh, I, I don't know how accurate they were back in the 50s, but I know they were taking them. Um, so we've had some presidents and presidential candidates who do seem to dismiss public opinion polls and actually govern on the basis of what they believe is in the national interest uh, and come closer, perhaps, to that conception of statesmanship than a lot of the folks we see on the scene these days. Look, I grant you this is, this is going to be really hard to roll back, really hard, if not impossible. I try to be optimistic. Um, but it's doable, I think. Um, I'll, I'll have to leave it at that. Maybe something else will come to me. But look at, look at Dwight Eisenhower. I think he's a good example. Uh, actually, you know what, I would also say possibly Ronald Reagan now. Because Ronald Reagan took a number of unpopular stands. I mean, you know, being pro-life in 1980s America was not exactly a winning stance in many quarters of the country, probably a majority of the country. Supporting the Contras in Nicaragua, I can tell you, I know the public opinion poll numbers on that. He was constantly swimming upstream on that. Uh, even his advocacy, at least in his first term of domestic spending cuts, there was substantial popular resistance. So, you know, it, it can be done, it has been done, um, but it requi you know, requires a lot of courage, political courage. Uh, sorry, someone else? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, when you talk about the Hamilton, are you talking of like an old Whig theory for the presidency, or is this something different? Um, it's definitely a Hamiltonian conception, which I think maybe by old Whig you mean the Taft, uh, William Henry Harrison, uh, the Whig, that theory. The Whigs, the yeah, the Whigs were in some ways descendants of the old federal of the Federalists who had died off. Uh, so yes, the Hamiltonian conception of the presidency differs from the Jacksonian conception of the presidency, and they, the difference would be. Hamilton sees the president as a check on popular excess. Hamilton sees the presidency as a defender of property rights. Hamilton sees the presidency as a defense against excessive egalitarianism, the successive, excessive focus on equality. So in that sense, there are connections between Hamilton and the old Whigs. Go ahead. My real question was going sure. to be, uh, uh, how would this, this um, look in today's foreign policy? This seems um, it would sort of draw back on foreign policy. Yeah, I'm not sure it would. I'm not sure it would. And this, see, in Hamilton's conception of the president was not, it, it, he didn't see it as a weak president. This was going to be an energetic presidency. And in fact, the president would be at the peak of his powers in a way in matters of what we would call today national security. Uh, again, the whole point of Washington and Hamilton and the nationalists, if you want to call them that, during the convention era, was to infuse in this new government the powers needed to defend the interests of the United States in the international arena. 
so I don't, I'm not, ta we're not talking here isolationism necessarily. We're not, we're not talking about a president who has to call Congress back into session before he can respond to an attack. That, that's not what I'm saying. Um, so Hamilton's energetic executive meant that if the United States is attacked, and he was explicit about this, the president does not have to wait for a declaration of war. At that point, a declaration of war is a mere formality. We're at war. He can move. If Congress wants to declare war, that's fine, but it's a formality. Um, thanks, Kevin. Sure. Uh, I, uh, the question that I have that kind of arises out of Logan's question is, sure. so Hamilton had this big vision for uh, the presidency and foreign policy and national security. Um, so he was, he like oversees how, how we conduct wars. Um, a lot of the, but a lot of presidential abuses of power yeah. are rooted in national security. Um, and it, it, it did not that like idea of the president being really involved in foreign policy and national security kind of lay the soil for people like Teddy Roosevelt? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a great question, and you could argue that Lincoln, especially during the Civil War, built the foundation or laid the foundation that led to some of the abuses of presidential power in the 20th century. I, I don't buy that argument, but you could. Um, look, the difference, what, what sets T.R. and Wilson apart is they try to, as I put it, mainstream this notion of extraordinary presidential power. They bring it into the domestic sphere. It's a domestic policy. Go ahead. A lot of domestic policies seem to, well, you, you need to implement domestic policies to carry, like Woodrow Wilson, he implemented the income tax um, in, when we went to World War Through World an War. amendment. And that stayed. And that's, well, yeah, it, but, it, but it, like, st it stuck around. Yeah. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of encroachments of power, they, 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 they trickle over into the domestic sphere. From, from wartime. From wartime, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, that's a fair effect, point. That's a fair point. I would, you know, Lincoln's attitude was that once this Civil War emergency was over, it's back to normal. Now, maybe that was wishful thinking, but to some extent it wasn't. I mean, there was a reaction against presidential power right after the Civil War. I mean, Congress impeaches his successor. They don't succeed in removing him, but they impeached him. Uh, the Supreme Court knocks down some of Lincoln's Civil War decisions in the Milligan case. Uh, in a way, we did revert to congressional government. The 19th century, the history of the American 19th century, it seems to me, is a history of congressional domination. I mean, the Jacksons and the Lincolns are the exceptions. It's, you know, Rutherford B. Hayes and Chester Arthur and, uh, you know, Benjamin Harrison, not to pick on the people from Ohio and elsewhere, but I mean, you know, <laughs> it's... These, these guys, the standouts in American political life in the 19th century are the Websters and the Clays and the Calhouns. And the center of action is the Congress. So, again, I, yes, you could make a case that Lincoln sort of uh, contributed to the foundation, but I, I do think that gets overstated. I really think there's a radical break that occurs with the progressives, and in particular with Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. And it is this, I mean, you would never hear Lincoln say, um, Lincoln always tried to couch his actions in constitutional language. He always played or paid obedience to the Constitution and to the founders. Wilson and T.R., Wilson especially, they're dismissive of the founders. They're great, they set up, they gave us some political freedoms, but it's a new world. And we've got to move beyond these guys. It's over. And you see it in the scholarship of people like Charles Beard, who completely dismiss the framers as being irrelevant to 20th century industrial life. It's a radical break, in my view. Yes, sir. Uh, appreciate you joining us. Sure. Um, now, you, in your speech, you talked a little bit about public opinion. Right. And I think Lincoln put a great deal of emphasis on the importance of public opinion. So with the Teddy Roosevelt,
Lincoln always paid tribute to the American public, but I, again, I don't, I, I don't recall seeing him or remember reading him saying, it's, uh, it's the president's, again, Lincoln constantly said that when the war, when this emergency was over, the way we used to do business is going to return. You just don't see that in T.R. and Wilson. This is a permanent mainstreaming of this notion of the president with these extraordinary powers. And it's this kind of constant state of emergency, in a sense. As I said, this language of war, wars on poverty, wars on cancer, wars on this, wars on that, that's, that's mainstreaming warlike thinking. It's mainstreaming <laughs> emergency conceptions of presidential power. That's not Lincoln. I mean, Lincoln, uh, you, I'm sure this won't come. Prior to Teddy Roosevelt, American presidents did not go out and try to go around Congress by speaking directly to the people and say, we need to adopt policy X. They didn't do it. Lincoln would give a July 4th address, and he'd give an inaugural address, and he'd issue statements. But presidents did not go out and attempt to shape public opinion. It just wasn't done. It cha that changes with T.R. and with Wilson. And what they're trying to do is circumvent Congress. They're trying to go around the separation of powers and peel over the congressmen's heads directly to you and to me. You need to pressure your guy to do X. That is a radical change. Uh, yes, sir. And then. Uh, you mentioned that there was a shift between uh, uh, the parties going out and selecting individuals that conform to their principles now to candidates coming in, taking the party, and Correct. forming them to their own. Do you think there's anything to be said of having more than two parties to have a candidate to come into? I know in Europe, for instance, you know, they've got five or six major or parties more. that a candidate, exactly, that a candidate can go into because they most conform yeah. uh, to their principles of <coughs> the governing, and then the people have an option of you know, four or five parties. Well, this is probably not going to come as any surprise, but I like the two-party system. I may be the last American left who, who actually <laughs> believes that. Uh, but I, I think the, two, the American two-party system has been a source of stability for the United States. And we're, we're not Italy. Uh, and by that, I mean in Italy there are 40, 50, 60 different political parties from extreme left to extreme right. And that produces a series of unstable governments. Those governments are always falling or collapsing in Italy. Uh, so the fact that we have a kind of winner-take-all system here, there's a number of reasons why the two-party system has per persisted. Uh, but in my view, that's a sign of health. I know Americans get antsy. They feel sometimes that not, neither party um, is listening to them. And certainly there are things that could be done perhaps to improve that. But I would hate to see the two-party system go. I think we'll regret it. I really do. One of the things the two-party system does is take the edge off extreme, extremist views, usually. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, and then in the back. Yes, sir. Sorry. Thank you for coming in. Um, what do you, you talked about foreign policy a little bit in terms of the executive. What do you think someone like Alexander Hamilton would think of the debates that we're having today about Are we having that debate? Are we having that debate today? Uh, if we were having it. I don't mean to be, if we were, okay, if we were having it. Uh, I think if Hamilton were to, come, were to come, I think if all the founders were to come back, they'd have mixed reactions. They'd be impressed, Hamilton in particular, and perhaps Washington would be impressed by the fact that the United States is still the world's greatest economic power, is arguably still the world's greatest military power, uh, with impressive accomplishments throughout our history, technological breakthroughs, I and mean, we still clean up in the Nobel Prizes. Uh, they would have been impressed by all of that. I think even the most die-hard Federalist, however, including Hamilton, would say that the federal government is trying to do too much, whether it's domestic policy or perhaps even foreign policy. Um, you know, Hamilton specifically said in the Federalist Papers, Basically, the national government will focus on issues of war, international commerce and trade, and um, I think it was economic uh, 
trade between the states. That it was a somewhat limited conception. It wasn't, he, in fact, in one point he flat out says, the federal government will have no interest in agriculture policy. <laughs> uh, so if he were to go to Washington and you would take him to the department, that behemoth Department of Agriculture building, see, even he, I think, would, would say, you, you're trying to do too much, and when you try to do too much, you don't do anything particularly well. Uh, but, back, but in foreign policy, I think Hamilton would be impressed by, again, just our international reach. Um, he may not put his stamp of approval on every war we've ever entered. He was a realist, so he probably would have had problems with some of the wars when we seem to have gone off and tried to remake other societies in our image. Uh, but he would be impressed overall by our international stature. He'd probably be depressed, depressed uh, by the absence of any serious debate in the current election. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, no, get to I was just wondering your opinion on, uh, many people believe that the progress fair was actually a reaction to the Gilded Age. Sure. And that it was kind of a necessary thing, and it wasn't necessarily based on just TR and its liberal sure. philosophy of the presidency. Fair and, point. Um, I was wondering if you believe like the progressive era, and then like in a vacuum, <coughs> as an isolated president, without any um, presidents following suit like JFK or LBJ, do you think it was kind of a, a necessity? Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, you know, TR's argument was that industrialization had changed the United States so much that you now needed this assertive federal president to check the robber barons, to check the excesses of the Gilded Age. And, and I have to admit, it's a fairly, it's a compelling argument. And I sometimes get into this with some of my conservative friends when we talk about Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt, certainly his supporters argue that Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, saved American capitalism. And there's, a, you know, there's, an, there's a good argument to be made for that. The fact was you had about a third of the United States unemployed, we think. We don't even know there were so many. Um, do you tell those people to simply wait for the business cycle to kick in? Uh, what if in the interim those folks decide to uh, take up arms? And what if we end up like the Weimar Republic in Germany where some extremist like Yui Long or Father Towns, uh, or, excuse me, Father Coughlin and some of these other extremists who are saying, we can do better than this. And they had some pretty wacky ideas about what they meant. Uh, so I, I don't necessarily have a great answer for you in terms of I can understand why the progressives came about. I guess what I don't understand is this zeal to trash the founders that you see in a lot of progressive thought. It seems to me you could have uh, made arguments without, in a sense, undermining the constitutional order, which is what many of them did, and I think to, to ill effect. Uh, that's kind of a rambling answer, but you want to follow up with that? Oh, it's just a fair point because, like, there was with like corporate magnets taking over, like, sure. their influence over senators and child labor, yeah, and women not being able to vote, which is something that kind of followed later on, and just all these well, terrible working the conditions. Key, true. They, I think, in my opinion, it was almost necessary for someone like TR to be president and to have this more aggressive view because otherwise it seems like politicians are just getting trampled on by these powerful yeah. men. TR certainly believed he was necessary, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one alternative would be that the states, the states could have, and in fact the states did. In fact, the states were ahead of the federal government, and some of these states were ahead of the federal government in terms of child labor laws. and. I think uh, Justice Brandeis, I believe, I think it was Brandeis, referred to the states as these laboratories of experimentation. You know, Massachusetts was doing one thing, New York another. And so the states were doing things to kind of take the edge off some of the abuses of, uh, of the Gilded Age. Uh, so that's, that's a possible alternative. But again, there was just this kind of radical, I don't hesitate to use this word, this radical contempt for the founders and the fact that we needed to just put these people on the ash heap of history 
and you know leave them behind and start anew. And I don't, they didn't need to go that far. And I think by going that far, they've done a lot of damage. They've unhinged the American political order from its founding anchor. Good question, though. Yes. Um, okay. sorry. I'll take this gentleman and then in the back. Go ahead. Um, and this is going way back, so I'm sorry. But um, earlier you mentioned term limits. How did term limits, um, as they you know now are now a constitutional thing, yeah. the PR, how does that play with the Hamiltonian conception of the presidency? Yeah, he would not be thrilled. Uh, Hamilton's argument was that the longer a person is in place, um, you know, they learn the job, they get up to speed on the job, they feel a certain possession for the office and therefore they'll protect its prerogatives against encroachments from the other branches. He uh, kind of liked it in a way to, you can think of it in these terms, you have a piece of property and you actually own that piece of property, you're going to take care of it. If you're renting that piece of property, if you're just kind of just passing through, you know, you're going to have a keg party and trash the place. I'm just, sorry. It's Friday. Um, so ownership of an office, in a sense, was a good thing. And he also makes, I think, a very important point, and unfortunately, we may pay the price someday. If we get into a serious shooting war, uh, and we're in the second term of a president, that commander in chief is out. There's no exceptions to the 22nd Amendment. And, you know, we're going to have to replace that man or woman in midstream in the middle of a conflict. So uh, Hamilton would argue it's best not to handcuff yourself in such a way where you just can't predict the circumstances that may arise. So uh, Jefferson thought the one defect in the Constitution was the absence of presidential term limits. And he gets his way in the 1950s. Hamilton would have been opposed to the 22nd Amendment. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. Uh, I just want to go off something that Stephen said. Sure. Thank you for coming as well. Um, you talked about in your, in your presentation that the, there's this expectation from the president nowadays to deliver on certain promises. Um, how much longer are Republicans able to uh, talk the talk of wanting this limited government, this limited You know, look, we're, this is unfolding as we speak. I mean, Donald Trump came out the other day and endorsed a fairly ambitious, I think it was a child care program of some sort. Uh, and then you had people like Rush Limbaugh twisting themselves into knots trying to defend it. I mean, Limbaugh has been arguing for 25 years against big government, against federal programs such as this. I don't know what the future holds for the Republican Party or conservatives in general. Um, Donald Trump, this is my opinion, Donald Trump is not a conservative. He's about as far as you can get from a conservative, in my view. Uh, but he's the nominee of the party that, at least in the last, well, for quite some time now, has been nominating relatively conservative people. This guy is as far removed from that as you can get. It's, uh, I'll leave it at that. I probably already said too much. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you for coming. Sure. Um, so with the immersion of uh, German political thought in the 1800s, especially, sorry for saying his name, uh, Hegelian thought, um, is this, this change with PR and um, with Wilson, is it not inevitable? Would it, if not for these two men, would it not have happened eventually? It's possible. Uh, t <laughs> TR, both TR and Wilson were enamored with the Germans you know, with German political philosophy. Um, and there were others of their ilk. They mostly, surprisingly, came out of Harvard University and other Ivy League institutions. Um, I, I suppose somebody else would have picked up the, the torch. Yeah, that, that's, that's, you're asking me to sort of engage in conjecture. I, uh, probably. Go ahead. Is there any, would there have been any way to Calhoun, who was one of the first kind of people in America to kind of take 
hate the torch for Hegel, um, but especially in an era when people weren't as political, I guess it was more run like big, with big business, kind of what uh, Ben was talking about earlier. Is, is, was there anybody around that time that could have combated that and stopped the Hegelian? Well, I'll tell you who I thought at the, at, since I've <laughs> gone back and looked. I mean, I don't think, I, I think William Howard Taft did a nice job of trying to counter the uh, rage, the, 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 the growing uh, appeal of these sort of Germanic ideas. I think, I think Taft was, was terrific. Uh, but in a way, he was, he was a throwback. I mean, public, again, you know, the, part of what the progressives did is that they tore down all of the barriers that existed that kept public opinion in check. So uh, Taft was an anachronism and didn't have a lot in place to sort of uh, uh, to fight back. Uh, public opinion was becoming increasingly this, this, this new god that we all worship. And T.R. and Wilson were much more adept at benefiting from that than, than a guy like William Howard Taft is much more of a throwback. Can I take one more question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, sure. They tried to resist. Uh, you know, if you look at the history of the New Deal under Franklin Roosevelt, that court pushed back, in a way, remarkably for, for quite a few years. I mean, during Roosevelt's first term in office, there were all sorts of decisions that struck down various New Deal initiatives. But in classic progressive fashion, I mean, FDR's response was, all right, we'll just change the court. We'll pack it with, you know, what was it? For every judge over the age of 70 will appoint younger blood, younger blood people who don't live in the horse and buggy days, who, are, who understand that this is a new world order we're living in. And they'll be up to date. FDR did actually use the horse and buggy language when he condemned the Supreme Court. So the court did push back until the mid-1930s. FDR's court packing plan went down to defeat. Even some of his fellow progressives thought this was too radical too dangerous, too upsetting to the constitutional system of separation of powers. But what happened was that one or two of the justices began to sort of shift their position. Uh, and he began to win his court cases, and then vacancies occurred, and he made sure he put good progressives in place on the court. So, you know, the court tried. Uh, boy, he went after them tooth and Again, this is, this is sort of, this is, see, this is, this is a different, and some of you have been asking this question, you know, didn't Lincoln plant the seeds, or maybe some earlier folks. It's, it's rare for a president to, like, publicly go after the Supreme Court, or at least it was. Um, you know, FDR sets new ground. I mean, I know Andrew Jackson supposedly uttered the famous line, you know, Justice Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. He may not have said that, we're not sure. But FDR, we know, he gave public speeches. You know, excoriating the Supreme Court. That's different. Uh, Abraham Lincoln had his problems with Justice Taney, for sure, uh, in the Merriman case, but most of that sort of private correspondence, he's not out there railing against the Supreme Court. In fact, a lot of times he's saying, look, we need to obey this law as much as it's repulsive, and we need to work to change it. With FDR, it's like these guys are living in the past. They're they're creatures of Wall Street, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's demagogue here. <coughs> one more? You, want, you can take as many as you like, but let's, let's keep it to just maybe one or two more. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. You uh, said earlier that uh, you think that you would, we would regret getting rid of the two-party system. What would you I do. say to uh, people that think the two-party system is getting in the way of us choosing the best presidential candidate? I would point them to modern times and say, well, I, I'm somebody who believes in, in a sense, the old smoke-filled room. I mean, not every decision needs to be hashed out in public. Not every decision should be influenced by talk radio, talk radio and the internet. Um, there's an argument to be made for if 
not necessarily secrecy, but for deliberation, for thinking, for representation. We are supposed to elect representatives who aren't just supposed to be robots who do what their constituents back home do. The founder's conception of representation was that these representatives would refine and enlarge the public views, as they put it in the Federalist Papers. Those arguments have been lost. We're so enamored with this notion of popular rule. And um, uh, this political scientist, Hugh Hecklow, that I cited earlier, calls it hyper-democracy. Deliberation is dead. The notion of uh, representation, I mean, the Senate used to be selected by states. Now, thanks to the progressives, they are directly elected due to the 17th Amendment. Uh, the whole thrust of the 20th and 21st century is towards further democratization, for, towards further public input. I don't think we've benefited from that. I mean, the public can be wrong, as Hamilton was fond of saying. Uh, and then he was accused of being an, el an elitist as a result. <laughs> Uh, you know, the public was wrong just prior to the Second World War. Most, some polls show the American public didn't want to engage Adolf Hitler. You know, Franklin Roosevelt, in a sense, maneuvered the United States, you could argue, into that war. I would argue he was right. I would argue Franklin Roosevelt had a clearer conception of Adolf Hitler than a lot of folks in the United States did on Main Street. So. The argument needs to be made for representation, for deliberation, for statesmanship. And let's move beyond this idea that everything needs to be put to some sort of public plebiscite. That's, I'd start with that and try to <laughs> move from there. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Go ahead. Yeah. Good question. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, thank you for coming. Absolutely. Yeah. Make the yeah, well, you know, I mean, Congress continually roll. Again, I'm a champion of an energetic executive, but Congress <laughs> continually rolls over in the face of, of strong presidents. Um, you know, one thing, and I thought George W. Bush made a mistake, but he should have asked for a declaration of war against Afghanistan when they were the Taliban, when they refused to hand over bin Laden and shut down the camps. That was the perfect opportunity to restore some of Congress's war-making authority. The country was united. He would have won that vote easily. Um, but he decided not to do it for a variety of reasons. But Congress really didn't push back. They should have. You know, they should have. Uh, and one thing that does is it gets Congress on record. It makes them part and parcel of the decision-making process. Right now, they have, they have the best of both worlds. They can let the president take the lead on these controversial initiatives, and then when it goes south, they can jump on him like, you know, ugly on an ape. Uh, that's a political science term, but. Uh, uh, so yes, Congress can do things. Congress should step up to the plate, uh, but they're usually inclined to let either the courts or the presidents do the, the dirty work for them. Uh, out of a desire to simply win re-election, perhaps, and avoid making the tough choices. All right. By the way, I would strongly recommend, if you have a chance, to go see the hip-hop musical on Alex. <laughs> <laughs> if you can afford it by getting a second mortgage. Uh, so have you seen it? I have seen it. It's extremely well done. Uh, actually, fairly accurate. A few little qualms here and there, but it's, uh, it's well worth it. I know it's coming to Chicago, I think, uh, October. <laughs> there you go. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, before you go, I'll just mention that uh, we have some copies of Professor Knott's book here, which uh, are available for purchase, right, at $20, I think. And perhaps Professor Knott, if he's willing to stick around oh, for a little bit, is willing yeah. to sign those. So if you'd like one, come up and, uh, and get one. Uh, thank you all for coming, and happy Constitution Day. Have a great weekend.